Greetings, everybody. Uh, I was going to finish up the Fruits series. Uh, I've just got to finish the conclusion. But, uh, you know, the, um, I found something out that's very interesting. Did you know that the Temple of Solomon and the Temple of Herod, the one that was destroyed in Jesus' well, when the temple that Jesus went to, they were not the same temple. They were built on the same spot, but they weren't not the same temple. Did you know that both temples were destroyed on the same exact date according to the Jewish calendar? I found that extremely interesting. So let's take a look at something here. According to Hebrew, uh, H E B C A L, that's Hebrew calendar, dot com, backslash, holidays, backslash, T I S H A dash B A V, I read the following Tisha Biav, if I'm pronouncing that right, the ninth of A V, is an annual fast day in Drew Judaism, named for the ninth day, Tisha, the month of A V, in the Hebrew calendar. The fast commemorates the destruction of both the first and second temple in Jerusalem, which occurred about 655 years apart, but on the same, but on the same Hebrew calendar date. And supposedly it happened uh, right after the Sabbath. I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, and it basically corresponds to the end of July or the very first of August. And you got to realize something. A circle, a perfect circle would be 360 degrees. You know, you'd have uh, 12 months of three of, of 30 days each. But the Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. It's kind of elliptical. So it's about 364 days and a quarter and that's why every fourth year we add a, add a leap a leap day. Um, I'm sorry, 365 and a quarter, not 64. 365 days and a quarter. And then every fourth year, fifth year, whatever, they add a, a leap day or whatever. So basically the um, equinox is, is what sets apart the beginning of the year and um, that, that's the start of the year. And according to God's calendar, the Hebrew calendar, uh, the spring was the beginning of the year. Now, let's face it, that's when you would plant the crops. You know, so from what I understand, 14 days after the beginning of the year was Passover. Uh, you know, that's, what are, what are the coincidences the chances of a coincidence of both temples being destroyed on the same day. I mean, let's face it. Is God sending the Jews a message or what? Now, the first temple was prophesied against Jerusalem and the temple in books like Jeremiah and Isaiah King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire. And uh, according to the Bible, it was probably the most greatest empire that ever existed. Not great as in spiritually great, but just in terms of sheer land area. The largest, I guess you could say, the most complete. And when you get to the book of Revelation, they talk about mystery. Babylon the Great. See, Babylon merged a lot of false religions, and God was angry with Jerusalem and Judah, and he and basically he's like, hey, you don't want to serve me, I'm going to let you serve King Nebuchadnezzar, see how you like it. So let's take a few verses here from the Bible. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined, 
and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings, their works, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Jeremiah 4.14. Now, all these are the destruction of the first temple. This was a temple that Solomon built. Solomon, the, the son of David, King David, you know, David and Goliath. Um, Jeremiah 4.14. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. Wash your heart from wickedness, that you might be saved? Ooh. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Jeremiah 8, verse 5. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. Jeremiah 9, 11. And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons. A den of dragons? What does the Bible say about dragons? All right, let's take a look at what the Bible says about dragons and dragon. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon, dragon, was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So the dragon is called the serpent, the devil, and Satan. Okay? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Hmm. And uh, when you go to Revelation 12, 17... And the dragon was wroth. What does it mean to be wroth? It means to be angry. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war, war, with the remnant of her seed, children, which keep the commandments of God, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, the dragon's going to be angry with the woman. He's going to make war with the remnant of, this, uh, of the, you know, the children of the woman. But there's two conditions. They got to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So I guess that excludes Judaism, doesn't it? Okay. So back to Jeremiah 9:11, and I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons. And I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Okay. Well, that happened after uh, Nebuchadnezzar came. He absolutely destroyed. And he took everybody captive. He took them as slaves. He took them to Babylon. All right. Jeremiah 13, verse 27. I have seen thine adulteries and thy names, the lewdness of thy whoredom. And thy abominations on the hills, in the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? Jeremiah 19.3 And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place. The which, whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle. Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 14. I have, also, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Ooh. They're likened as to Sodom and Gomorrah. Contrast this with Revelation 11, verse 8. Now, this is talking about the two witnesses 
of the book of Revelation, the ones that confront the false prophet and the beast. After they're killed by the beast. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Hmm. So the great city is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That's talking about Mystery Babylon. Where was Christ crucified? Jerusalem. Let's face it. Do you know that um, Tel Aviv is the civil capital of the Israeli state? And then you got Jerusalem, of course, but Tel Aviv is the seat of the government. Do you know that they've been having, uh, they've had numerous gay pride parades in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem? Look it up on YouTube. Type in gay pride. Gay Pride, Tel Aviv, Tel Gay Pride, Jerusalem. Yeah, they have gay pride parades. Matter of fact, I think in Tel Aviv they had, it's considered the gay capital of the Middle East. Uh, let's see, I think they had a quarter of a million people at their spiritually Sodom place there one year. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, whether it's 100,000 or 250,000, does it really make a difference? which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So, Jeremiah 23, 14, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem and horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Doesn't sound like much has changed in hundreds or thousands of years, right? Jeremiah 44, verse 9. Have ye forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, and the wickedness of the kings of Judah, and the wickedness of their wives, and your own wickedness, and the wickedness of your wives, which, have, which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Lamentations. 1 and verse 8. Jerusalem have grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. Removed to where? She was removed to Babylon. Jerusalem have grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. All that honored her despised her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backward. Book of Ezekiel, 16 verse 2. Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. Malachi, verse 2 and 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned, profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. How about hundreds of years later? Book of Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus speaking. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Not Rome. Rome didn't kill the prophets. Jerusalem killed the prophets because they didn't like the message that God told them through the prophets. You know, yeah, Rome killed Christians. I agree. But they didn't kill the prophets. The prophets weren't sent to Rome. They were sent to Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicken under her wings? And ye would not. All right, let's read John chapter 19. Now, the... the the Jewish temple guards have arrested Jesus in the garden after Judas betrayed him. And now they're taking him to Pilate, who's the governor, the Roman governor of the province of Judea. John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. 
whipped him. That's what it means to be scourged, whipped. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns. Isn't that interesting? Thorns and thistles. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve fell, they, they were told that the ground would be cursed. Thistles and thorns it would bring up. Well, here it is. Jesus is getting a crown of thorns. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put him, put on him a purple robe. Purple denotes royalty, people. And said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. So here it is, Pilate brings Jesus before the Jews, and he says, I, I find no fault in this guy. You know? Then came forth Jesus wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, these are not Catholic priests, by the way, they're Jewish priests. When the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Now you'd better believe Pilate had sent spies to follow Jesus around to see what was going on. Jesus had crowds of thousands of people hanging around him. You better believe somebody with that many people hanging around that, that civil rulers are going to send spies to hear what's going on. What's this guy saying? Is he calling for a, a riot, a revolution? You better believe that Pilate's spies had told him how he had healed the sick and cured those people of the palsy and, and maybe even raised the dead like Lazarus, how he'd cast out devils. I tell you what, you see a guy with a withered leg, like a pencil stick, and all of a sudden Jesus touches him and, and his legs are healthy and pink, and he gets up leaping and running around you better believe that kind of stuff would get the attention. And, you know, even in the Jewish Talmud, they admit that Jesus performed many, many miracles. Of course, they contributed to the power of Satan, the power of the devil, but they admit he did, he did miracles. Why was, why was Pilate afraid? The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Yeah, I'd be afraid too, man. All my spies, I have, you know, a dozen different spies, and they all tell me the same story. This guy's performing miracles that only God himself could do. And then, and then they say, oh, this guy says he's the Son of God. I'd be afraid too. Pilate had more... Uh, Pilate, as an unbeliever, had more sense than the Jews. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? In other words, who are you? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Who has the greater sin? The Jews that delivered him to Pilate. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. Oh, but it was the Romans that killed Jesus, right? That's what that's what uh, John Hagee's church preaches. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. 
Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. You see, they're accusing Pilate. You let Jesus go, and we're accusing you of treason before Caesar Augustus, or Caesar whatever his name was, of Rome. And you know what the punishment was for treason against the Roman Empire? Death. You let Jesus go, we're going to put you on, have you put on trial for treason and see that you're put to death, Pilate. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. See, now Pilate, he's between a rock and a hard place. He wants to let Jesus go. But if he lets him go, he's in danger of being accused of treason. That's not a very good place to be. So he, he fears Jesus, but he fears Caesar too. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried, Away with him. Listen carefully, and he saith, Pilate, and he saith unto the Jews. Pilate is speaking to the Jews. Don't forget that. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out. Who's they? The Jews. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Wow, tell that. Somebody should have told that to the Jews in 70 AD when they revolted against Rome. And the Roman armies came in to quell the uprising, to destroy the revolt, and destroy the temple and burned it to the ground. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he them, therefore unto them, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. Where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified, was nigh to the city. What city? Jerusalem. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews, Ah, oh, see, this shows you. Then said the chief priests of the Jews, not the Catholic priests. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said... I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it. Rend is a tear. You know, let's not tear it apart. Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. In other words, they're going to they're gonna gamble for it. Whoever wins the gamble gets the coat. Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. I believe that's in the book of Psalms, or it could be in Isaiah. I'm not sure. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, that was John, by the way, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that, and from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. So John took Mary to his home and took care of her. Evidently, Joseph had died. Evidently. So John was took Mary home to be, you know, taken care of, right? 
After this, knowing Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, the bitter vinegar, and think about it. Israel was likened to, to grapes. And what do they make out of grapes? Wine. And what happens when grapes, grape wine spoils? It turns to vinegar. It's bitter. And they put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. What's finished? The sacrifice for sin. The temple was no longer needed. He said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, his spirit. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, I believe this was Passover, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. You see, when you die, the blood separates, the water separates from the blood. Baptism, right? Baptism of water. And by his blood we are washed. Amen. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Remember Nicodemus? He said, Verily, verily, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God? Oh yeah. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born a second time? Let's take a look at that real quick. All right. The book of John, chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That the same came to Jesus by night. You know, if you don't want to be recognized, you go in the night, right? And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? See, Nicodemus is thinking a physical birth. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, when they pierced Jesus' side, what came out? Water and blood, right? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. You know, this word wind is the word pneuma in the Greek. That's where we get the word pneumatic. Have you ever heard of pneumatic tools? P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-C. Sometimes it's translated as wind or air, and other times it's translated as spirit. Same word. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth? So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I hope I'm doing that in these Bible studies. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And now the most famous verse in the Bible, known by virtually everybody. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Are Jews condemned? The Bible, Jesus, his own words say, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. All right, let's go back to John 19. And verse... 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet lain. There laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. In Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus saith unto them, See, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And in 70 AD that was fulfilled. Matter of fact, I heard the temple burned for at least one complete day. They said that even the stones burned according to the Jews' history. I don't know if that's true or not, but and and so when you hear people say that the Wailing Wall is part of the temple, uh, well, either the Jews are correct and, and, the, and the Wailing Wall is part of the temple or Jesus is a liar. You can take your pick that uh, one stone shall not be left down upon another. That shall not be thrown down. Take your pick. Me, I pick Jesus. All right, let's take a look. In Matthew 24, verse 13, Jesus said, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. For lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Romans 1 and verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. Hmm. Very interesting. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Not the temple. Grace and faith. To the end the promised might be 
sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Romans 6.22 But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Romans 10.4 for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And that was when the temple was destroyed. I mean, that's how can they keep how can the Jews keep the law? They can't. It's impossible. Animal blood sacrificed ceased. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believeth. 1 Corinthians 1.8, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1.5, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Hebrews 3.6, but Christ is, Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Hebrews 3.14 For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Hebrews 9.26 For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Do you know that Christ was to be a sacrifice from the foundation of the world? God made provision for us to be redeemed before we even knew what sin was. We were, re we were, we were a provision was made for us to be redeemed from the, cur the, the curse of sin and death in his own son. Think about that. And the Jews, re to this day, reject that. You would think that both temples being destroyed on the very same day would be a wake-up call to the Jews. You would think so. Wouldn't you? I mean, it's like an alarm clock going off at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but they hit the snooze button. Don't hit that snooze button too many times because you're going to be late for work. Hebrews 9.26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It is finished, people. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5. Who shall I give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity, that word charity is also translated as love, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. James 5.11 Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy. The Lord has pity and mercy upon us, believe me. I know I didn't have it. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And that's what the tribulation is going to be, people. You know, almost, oh, probably over 95% of the, 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 peop, the churches in the United States don't believe they're going to go through the tribulation. They've been so deceived that they're over and above God's chosen people. 
But Peter says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Ooh. And let's finish this with Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne saith, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. It is finished on the cross. It is done when he comes to take back possession of the heavens and earth from, from Satan. And he said, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Well, people, I think you get the point. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All glory to Jesus. Amen. <laughs>